So today we're going to be talking about systems genetics. So this is the last lecture in the module about genetics. So we're taking it to the systems level. And we're also going to be talking about electronic health records. So we're going to introduce linear mixed models, talk about heritability definitions, dive into LD score regression, and then electronic health records and GWAS integration. And we're very fortunate to have two guest lectures by Dr. Otis Price over at HSPH and uh, Dr. Man Manuel Rivas over at Stanford. So we're gonna review very briefly what have we seen so far in this module and then dive into linear mixed models, polygenic risk scores, heritability, and then talking a little bit about omnigenic models and then turning to all this core regression. I have some additional slides on advanced topics that we obviously will not have time to cover. And then we'll uh, switch over to Alkis and Manuel. So just to review briefly where we stand, we've talked about common and uh, rare variants, strong effects and weak effects, and polygenic risk scores, the application domains of GWAS and linkage analysis. We've talked about linkage disequilibrium, which is your friend if you're trying to just simply find where are the blocks of association, because you can genotype only a subset of SNPs and then find the blocks but it becomes your enemy when you're trying to actually fine map what are the causal variants that are driving these associations. And that has been a, a very much the challenge of understanding the mechanism under, uh, underlying genome-wide association studies and why, um, why it's so difficult to interpret them because the vast majority of these associations are non-coding and they, and they have multiple SNPs meaning that we don't know the causal variant, we don't know the target gene, the cell type of action, the relevant pathways, and so on and so forth. So what we've been talking about in this module is how do we integrate epigenomic information for fine mapping variants, and then RNA information, variation information, and deep learning models for sequence function to start predicting driver genes, regions, and cell types to actually get the circuitry underlying these disease loci. And we saw how these apply to specific domains to actually allow us to both uncover the circuitry and then reverse the circuitry. And then uh, last time we looked at how we can actually use GWAS enrichments at the genome-wide level to find relevant tissues using just a very simple enrichment analysis. Today, the guest lecture by Dr. Alkis Price will uh, dive into one of the most prevalent methods for doing that, namely LD score regression. We talked about how we can use these enrichments for prioritizing the posterior probability of genetic variants. Given the many genetic variants in association, how we can use epigenomic information for prioritizing these variants, and how we can use this information to also prioritize subthreshold new disease loci by training on the genome-wide significant loci, and then applying this to subthreshold loci. And then we saw how we can use vastly increased numbers of tissues and cell types to start dissecting the components that contribute to complex traits like coronary artery disease into their liver specific, heart specific and uh, polyotropic uh, components. And, and then we turn to EQTLs and how we can trace the intermediate effects of these genetic variants down the path of causality and how we can start using imputation for predicting correlations between the genetic component of these intermediate molecular phenotypes and ultimately disease. And then we saw the nuts and bolts of EQTLs and specifically how we can look at expression as a linear regression predictor, a prediction from genotype and covariates. And we saw this uh, EQTL model that doesn't just use these regression coefficients uh, these effect size coefficients beta as products of the genotype of that individual, namely zero, one, two risk alleles, for example, or alternate alleles, uh, but also utilizing these covariates. Today, we're going to be expanding that to add additional population stratification effects. And in particular, we're going to be looking at linear mixed models for both GWAS and for EQTL calling. So what are linear mixed models? So we're basically going to be looking at both the fixed effects and the random effects that are resulting in the phenotype of interest. So the setup is very simple. We basically are trying to predict the set of phenotypes for, let's say, a thousand individuals using their genotypes for those thousand individuals 
across millions of locations across the genome. And these theta uh, vectors are basically telling us what is the contribution of every one of these genetic variants, plus some error, okay? So this is the basic framework within which we're gonna be uh, looking at prediction of phenotype. That phenotype could be expression or it could be height using some you know, fixed component and using these genotype dependent components. So who's with me here on the basic foundation of predicting the phenotype of a person based on the number of alternate alleles that they have and the effect size of each of these alternate alleles across all SNPs in the genome and across all individuals in our cohort. Uh, lovely, so we're at 53, 41, 6, 0, 0. So this is exactly the same thing written in linear algebra form. So we're basically gonna be applying the same scaling factors theta on every single genotype and then adding up all of the genome-wide effects for each person. Now, the question is, how is the noise distributed? And we can basically think of the noise as simply distributed across identically distributed individuals, where every single one of them has a noise centered at zero with some you know, squared uh, covariance matrix, which is basically um, a diagonal matrix that is simply scaling by a set of scalars, which are the variances for every individual, the same identity matrix. So all of these are IID, basically. The problem is that this actually might not be true. So what we want to actually think about is, in addition to this noise vector that is completely independent across individuals, we want to count to account for random effects that might be captured by a kinship covariance. What is a kinship covariance? That basically tells us how much of the genetic variance that we've measured is shared by every pair of individuals. So this is simply a vector that basically tells us for every individual, how much sharing do they have in their genetic loci. So we basically have the IID component and we also have a um, kinship component. And for many, many genome-wide association study problems, the most influential uh, random effects stem from population structure. So what we're gonna be doing is modeling those as a global uh, effect stemming from that covariance uh, kinship matrix. So we're gonna be using a, a, a Bayesian approach to account for these random effects by saying that they are distributed according to the kinship matrix and using this Bayesian approach that addresses and removes the uncertainty by averaging it out. So we're gonna be integrating over all of these uh, unknowns to uh, you know, using this um, kinship derived noise to basically say what is the probability of each of the phenotypic effects being driven by that uh, covariance matrix. And that's where the linear mixed model uh, will come in. So basically we'll be able to look at the phenotypic consequences as a linear function of the genotypic matrix plus an error component that incorporates both the IID error that we saw before and the kinship components, which is the relatedness. Hey, Algis, you're here already. <laughs> so, uh, Alkis, what time is your guest lecture starting? I thought it was 1.30, but I, I, I'm vaguely remembering that. I thought you had discussed switching to 1.15. Either way is fine with me. I do have a hard stop at 2 for my course. Okay, so um, I will try to wrap up uh, quite rapidly because I think you're going to be covering a lot of these things. So I'll, I'll try to wrap up in the next few minutes. So the basic foundation of these linear mixed models is that you're going to be building a joint model of all the SNPs and how do they explain the total heritability of a particular trait according to this infinitesimal assumption, which we can estimate using this restricted maximum likelihood model. And that avoids using an ML fit, an estimate for each of the param parameters, and instead uses transform data so that all of the nuisance parameters have no effect. And we're going to be using this variance components analysis, this random effects model that allows us to capture these transformations. 
So the beauty of all this is that it actually works despite not knowing the actual causal variants. So, and we're gonna talk about heritability uh, very shortly. So what this is allowing us to do is actually start capturing um, a lot of additional variation. So you can use this in two different ways. You can use this by predicting the effect on each of these, for example, intermediate molecular phenotypes from the instantiated SNPs of every individual. And that's very similar from the way that we talked about last time. Or you can directly use the linear relationships between the SNPs and the expression and the linear relationship between the expression and the trait to actually not have to have individual genotype variables instantiated for every one person, but instead combine these effects through the uh, LD uh, relate, relatedness of all your individuals and through the effects of each of your uh, SNPs and each of your genes on the ultimate phenotype. So you can use this to start predicting what are the effects of every SNP on the expression level, for example, for these intermediate phenotypes using uh, EQTL based SNP effect, and then using observed factors, which are your covariates that you have observed in your uh, cohort, but also hidden factors that can be learned de novo from your cohort. So you can use these um, models with an uninformative prior, or you can basically say, well, we expect these parameters to be centered at our maximum likelihood estimate or some other estimate. And then we have some potential noise surrounding that. And you can use prior distributions that match this with either a smooth or a very sharp um, centering on those. And then search through this parameter space to start inferring the uh, parameters that you would like. And in fact, one of those uh, strongest effects that is acting at the global level is in fact stemming directly from the population differences. So this is uh, this has been shown, in fact, by Alkis, who is here, um, to be one of the strongest effects driving these genetic matrices across, for example, the European continent, where if you look at the principal component analysis of the genotype matrix in absence of any kind of phenotypic effect, you basically see that the uh, position of all of your samples, according to the first two principal components of variation, is in fact recapitulating the geographic location from which they came within the European continent, indicating that there are these global cross-cutting effects on your genotypes. So uh, we can you know, use uh, all of this to now correct for those matrices and then uh, start um, inferring that. So I'm very tempted to switch directly to um, Alkis and maybe we can cover uh, this at the beginning of the lecture next time. Maybe one of the key points that I want to capture, I think that will be very helpful in, in preparing for Alkis's presentation, is the concept of heritability. The concept that we can basically ask how much of the phenotypic variance can we explain using additive effects, using dominance effects, and using interaction effects. And a lot of GWAS is underlying, uh, is, is making this underlying implicit assumption of additiveness whereby if I keep adding independent effects of every SNP in the genome, I will eventually capture some fraction of the total heritability. And this heritability is in fact allowing you to start asking how related are any two individuals phenotypically based on how related are any two individuals at the genotype level. And this actually gives you a very powerful approach for computing heritability as simply the ratio of phenotypic variance on genotype, uh, on, of phenotype similarity on genotype similarity. That's where it gets actually very interesting because you can actually start asking, uh, if I partition my genetic relatedness into subsets of the genome, instead of asking about this relatedness in the entire genome, I could ask for relatedness in a subset of the genome, for example, only chromosome one or only chromosome two or only chromosome three, chromosome four only, and so on and so forth. And what was really remarkable is that we found, or at least the field found, that the longer the chromosomes, and here they're ordered by their length, they're numbered by their length in the human genome, 
the longer the chromosomes, the more variance they explain for many, many of these complex traits, suggesting that phenotypic, uh, the, the phenotypic basis of disease is almost uniformly distributed across the genome. And you, know, you can basically take different geno one megabase genome chunks and then see how much heritability is captured there. And that is actually at the foundation of partitioning the genome in different ways. Instead of partitioning the genome using only chromosome by chromosome, you could start partitioning the genome based on phenotypic annotation or based on epigenomic annotation, for example, DNA hypersensitive sites or promoter regions or UTRs or coding regions. And that's in fact at the basis of this stratified uh, LD score regression that uh, Alkis will present shortly. So anyway, it's really a pleasure to have here uh, Alkis Price. He's a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he's actually one of the developers of many of these uh, models that uh, have been really driving the field in many ways. So Alkis, take it away. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Alkis Price from the Harvard School of Public Health. And uh, the title that I settled on for my brief presentation is Disease Critical Cell Types and Cellular Processes Across the Human Body. And this does, uh, as Manolis mentioned, make use of a tool called stratified LD score regression. Uh, when I'm teaching, I like to encourage people to jump in with any questions and comments you might have, both because it's more fun and because it may actually be more informative for everybody that way. So please don't be shy about jumping in. I know Manolis won't be. Uh, all right, so this is the uh, outline uh, of my presentation. And I'm gonna start with a methods piece and not with a biological motivation piece. But if you would like to know what the biological motivation of why it would be you know, useful to humankind to learn about disease critical cell types across the human body, you can find some of that biological motivation in this review paper. Uh, but onto the methods piece. And this piece is about stratified LD score regression. The most pertinent reference is Fanucanel 2015. And so I'm gonna start with a, a, a definition of SNP heritability. Now there are different definitions of heritability out there, all of which are important. This particular definition is a function of a particular set of SNPs. And so the underlying value of this quantity in the population is a function not only of the population that you're studying, obviously it's a function of which disease or trait you're studying, it's also a function of which set of SNPs you're studying. If you have a large set of SNPs, then that may have a larger SNPs heritability associated to it than some small set of SNPs. And so with that in mind, we're going to define SNP heritability as a parameter that's defined in the entire population as the maximum value that you could attain in the entire population in terms of maximizing the R squared between your, your phenotype and any linear combination of the genotypes. So this is defined as a parameter in the entire population. I don't need to make any kind of special assumptions to, to make this definition. And then, of course, if I happen to have in hand data from some finite sample, then, you know, if I'm lucky, I might have some good method that could provide a pretty good, unbiased, not too noisy estimate of this parameter, you know, based on the finite amount of data that I have. And as Manolis noted a moment ago, the GCTA method of Yang et al. 2010 is, is the kind of, uh, you know, main paper or first big paper in this space of estimating SNP heritability from human genetic data but I'm not going to go into the details of that right now. Uh, and so above and beyond estimating a single SNP heritability parameter across the entire genome, uh, a wrinkle on that that may be potentially very interesting is to define and estimate a SNP heritability parameter uh, for different functional categories. And so when I talk about functional categories, we'll get into this, but you can think about coding versus non-coding SNPs, you know, regulatory SNPs, SNPs that are conserved across mammals. You know, there's different flavors of SNPs in the genome, and it's of interest to partition uh, heritability across those different functional categories of SNPs. And so if we have multiple functional categories of SNPs, maybe we partitioned all SNPs into, you know, five or 10 or 20 different functional categories, then we can, uh, uh, you know, we can generalize this definition um, to variances explained by the set of SNPs in each respective category. And uh, this can enable us to reach conclusions. Well, then we, then we have to think about doing estimation in a finite sample, using data from a finite sample, which I'll get to momentarily. But this could enable us to draw conclusions like, 
you know, coding SNPs are enriched for heritability or, you know, regulatory SNPs or regulatory SNPs in a particular tissue are enriched for heritability of a particular disease or SNPs that are conserved across mammals are enriched for heritability or, or those types of conclusions. And again, there's a fundamental distinction, you know, in virtually any problem in this field bet uh, between on the one hand, providing a definition of a parameter that is a valid definition considered for an entire population. And on the other hand, coming up with an estimation method, which given a finite amount of data in a finite sample can endeavor to produce a, a good estimate. That's to say an unbiased estimate, hopefully with a low standard error of that population level parameter. All right. so. Uh, you know, in the early days of statistical genetics, everybody was analyzing individual level data, genotypes and phenotypes for each of thousands of individuals. But as we as we get into, you know, bigger data sets and consorti disease consortia that are meta-analyzing, you know, summary association statistics from 40 different cohorts, as we move into this phase of, 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 of the history of statistical genetics, there's an increased amount of interest in uh, analyzing summary statistic data and devising methods to analyze summary statistic data. And this is in large part responsible, um, you know, uh, this 2012 Nature Genetics editorial kind of precipitated this in which they requested, they didn't require it, but they requested that authors who publish in their journal publicly release their uh, summary association statistics, where by summary association statistics, I'm talking about GWAS association Z scores for each SNP, genotype or imputed SNP analyzed. Uh, and it, in some cases it can be useful to know the sample size uh, on which that z-score was computed, because there might be some SNPs which were poorly imputed and removed from a subset of the cohort, so the sample sizes may vary a little bit with the SNP, and it's useful to know that. And at the bottom of this slide, I've noted that in many of the applications, it's useful to have uh, reference LD information, linkage disequilibrium information about correlations between SNPs computed, for example, using some population reference panel, such as 1,000 genomes. And so mostly today, we'll be talking about uh, methods that analyze summary statistic data, which for certainly for most diseases you could think of, schizophrenia, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, whatever disease you're interested in, chances are you're going to have the best opportunity to analyze very large sample sizes if you're willing to kind of uh, have, willing to make do with summary statistic data rather than having complete access to individual level genotypes and phenotypes. All right, and so uh, the method I'm going to talk about, stratified LD score regression, is a method, uh, you know, first providing a little intuition before we get into the math, is that we're, we're gonna regress chi-squared association statistics from a disease GWAS. This is a regression performed across SNPs, and we're gonna regress the chi-squared association statistics with LD from different functional, with different functional categories. And the idea here is that if, if I, you know, if I wanna assess, for example, the hypothesis that there might be an excess of heritability in coding SNPs, I don't just want to look at the association statistics for coding SNPs and compare them to the association statistics for non-coding SNPs, because the association statistic, you know, it's not just coming from the causal effects of a given SNP, it's also coming from the tagging effects of a given SNP, where you're tagging other causal SNPs. And that's why, you know, the, the, the hypothesis might be something like SNPs that tag a lot of coding SNPs have higher chi-score statistics. That's kind of a more appropriate hypothesis to test than the hypothesis coding SNPs themselves have higher association statistics than other SNPs. And so this, this method relies on the very fundamental idea um, due to various different Yang et al. papers that when you're running a GWAS, an average chi-squared greater than one does not imply confounding. So, you know, back in the old days, a long, long, long time ago, people thought, well, you know, if I'm running a GWAS, you know, maybe using only a few thousand samples, nearly all the SNPs are probably null SNPs, which should under the null have, you know, an average chi-squared of one, or you can also compute the median chi-squared, which is a little bit more robust to outliers. That's called lambda genomic control, but I'm not going to get into that. You know, at a small sample size, the average chi-squared should be pretty close to one. In the old days, when your average chi-squared was substantially above one, people would think, oh no, my average chi-squared is greater than one. I must have some kind of problem with confounding due to, you know, population stratification or cryptic relatedness or something like that. But people, you know, realized over time, particularly in this Yang et al. 2011 paper, people realized over time that as we get to large sample sizes, we can expect our average chi-squared statistics to be greater than one due to true polygenic signals. And some of this math is from Yang et al. 2011, where we actually can write down as a function of the SNP heritability, well, both the SNP heritability and the amount of LD, um, the precise extent to which we expect the average chi-squared to be bigger than one. And so this equation over here, this is an equation which literally specifies 
the precise amount by which you expect average chi-squared to be bigger than one. And the more LD you have, uh, you know, this, this quantity here is the average LD score across SNPs, where an LD score is just a sum of R squareds that a SNP has with itself as well as other SNPs. The more LD you have, um, the, more, the higher the average chi-squared is going to be because the chi-squared um, association statistic, the amount by which it exceeds one due to causal, you know, due to, due to true signal. Well, that true signal could be causal signal where a SNP is biologically causal, but it could also be tagging signal where a SNP is not biologically causal, but is correlated to some other SNP that's biologically causal and thus has sort of true signal an average chi-squared greater than one. So this, this idea that goes back to Yang et al. 2011, that an average chi-squared and greater than one does not imply confounding, but is actually an expected consequence of a particular level of SNP heritability coupled with a large sample size. This is the idea that kind of uh, lies at the, at the heart of this method, uh, stratified LD score regression. So we can start with, with LD score regression without functional categories. And it looked like from analysis outline, he might've already gone over it, but we can, we can still go over it. So here, we're just gonna, we're gonna regress for each SNP. This is a regression across SNPs. We're gonna regress for each SNP, it's chi-squared association statistic uh, on that SNP's LD score. That is to say, it's sum of R squareds with itself as well as other SNPs. And we expect that the intercept that we'll get from this regression should be equal to one if there's no confounding or greater than one if there is confounding. And so this is in practice, do you need to worry about any SNP out, outside your LD block? How far, how many LD blocks away? In practice, we've done this, uh, we've restricted the computation of the LD score to plus or minus one megabase, which, uh, you know, which is generally sufficient. I mean, LD for common SNPs, you know, typically only run, extends on average about you know maybe 50 KB in European populations going down to maybe 25 KB in African populations, which which were not subject to the out of Africa bottleneck, which increased LD. Uh, you know that that's on average. Obviously, you're going to have some LD spanning further than that, particularly as you go to low frequency SNPs. And so we uh, elected, I think, in all of these papers to go to plus or minus one megabase. Has anyone tried doing the full computation across all SNPs in the genome versus, say, just the one megabase neighborhood versus, say, a few LD blocks surrounding to see if there's any difference? Yeah. Um, so this gets complicated. I mean, th number one, it might be very computationally intensive. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, number one, it might be very computationally intensive. Number two, in, in if you're if you're looking at a if you're looking at a reference, if you're looking at a reference LD sample, there really isn't going to be any across chromosome LD. Like it's it's sort yeah. of in some sense, yeah, especially yeah. if it's a homo, very homogeneous LD reference panel, it's literally impossible for there to be a cross right. chromosome LD. Carry on, now, carry on. Sorry for the distraction. If you're so lucky to have uh, individual level data and access to the within GWAS samples LD, there could be a cross chromosome LD uh, due to um, chance, right? If I have a finite sample. You know, and this happens yeah. particularly often for rare SNPs. You know, if I have like a singleton, a singleton on one chromosome might be correlated, you know, to a singleton on another chromosome if it just happens by sheer chance that the reference allele is present in the same individuals for both of those SNPs that lie in different chromosomes. Yeah. And the situation seems to be, I mean, one of the projects in our group uh, led by postdoc Martin Zhang is, is kind of looking into this, looking into these issues in the case of rare SNPs. And once you start to go to rare SNPs, then the issue that you just raised, Manolis, kind of becomes more important and it becomes more appropriate to, um, uh, to consider sort of chance, not population level, but sample yeah. level uh, chance LD between chromosomes in the finite target sample. And right. there's theoretical reasons why in principle, you're actually more interested in the sample LD in the target sample than in the LD in the entire population, but that's that's a subtlety that it, it's probably not worth going into given the fine amount of time we have, and it doesn't actually make a big difference. So the short answer is don't worry about it, especially if you're focused on common SNPs. Beautiful. All right, and so uh, all of this stuff, you know, uh, might be most uh, intuitively interpretable using a real data set, and so this is um, this is a real schizophrenia data set, you know, from a from a landmark 2014 paper, and this is this is real data here, and on the x-axis we have, now it's not the case that each point is one single SNP because then it would be noisy and impossible to look at. But each SNP is like a collection of SNPs, an average of a set of SNPs with similar LD scores. So they're binned, SNPs built, binned by LD scores and these are LD score bins. And we can see on the right side of this plot, SNPs that have a ton of LD, like on average, they're you know, an LD with like 250 different SNPs. Well, if you're an LD with 250 other SNPs, 
then you're, ta you're potentially tagging a lot of SNPs. You're tagging a lot of SNPs that potentially might be causal. And so an expectation, you're going to have an average chi-squared because of all that signal that you're tagging from the other SNPs. Whereas if you have a low LD score, you know, close to one, which is the minimum LD score, because every SNP is going to be an LD with itself. As we look at these very low LD score SNPs, then it turns out when you run this regression, you see that they have average chi-squares very close to 1.0 which is basically re reflecting the fact that if you're you know, tagging close to zero SNPs in total, then you are actually gonna have null chi-squared association statistics, which is what you'd expect if there's no confounding. And so the fact that this intercept is close to one, that once you kind of subtract out the effect of LD and you're not, you're not an LD with a ton of other SNPs that, that might be causal that you're tagging, then your average chi-squared is kind of close to one. So average across the entire data set, the average chi-squared is 1.6, which is way bigger than one. And the fact that this intercept when you run this regression comes out to one means that that average, it's not due to confounding, it's predominantly due to uh, polygenic signal in proportion to the number of SNPs that you're in LD with or that you tag. And the fact that this intercept is one implies, or close to one, implies that it's not about confounding, it's about LD tagging of causal signal. So that's what it looks like if we don't have functional annotations. Well, that's the intercept tells you about confounding, then the slope if I may just briefly go back to the uh, main equation here in this slide, the slope can be used to estimate this quantity, which gets you to the SNP heritability. And so uh, the slope of being equal to this quantity can be used to estimate the SNP heritability. And we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about SNP heritability, which set of SNPs we're estimating the SNP heritability of. And it turns out in this case, we're estimating the SNP heritability of whichever set of SNPs is in our LD reference panel, such as thousand genomes. Now we can make this more complicated, add a layer, of, an interesting layer of complexity by saying, instead of just looking at, um, you know, at the total LD score of a SNP, we can look at the LD score of a SNP uh, with respect to SNPs in a particular functional category. So like, for example, the LD score of a SNP with respect to coding SNPs. And if that's, that's the sum of the R squares of that SNP with all coding SNPs. And then now, instead of, instead of the LD score always being at least one, if I take a non-coding SNP, it could in principle, be not an LD with any coding SNPs, and it could in principle have an LD or coding SNPs of zero, it's possible. And so we compute these sort of LD scores for each functional category of interest to us in turn. And then instead of doing a sort of unilinear regression of chi-squared statistic on LD score, we can do a multilinear regression of chi-squared statistics on the LD scores, on the respective LD scores of each of the functional categories that we're interested in. And it turns out that the respective slopes of that multilinear regression can tell you something about the, you know, SNP, the, the SNP heritability that's causally due to SNPs in that particular functional category. So the, the causal SNP heritability of coding SNPs, the causal, you know, SNP heritability of regulatory SNPs or regulatory SNPs in a particular tissue, and so on and so forth. And there's a, a fundamental quantity enrichment, which is just like for a particular functional category, let, let's say coding SNPs, what's the percentage of, of SNP heritability explained that, by that functional category versus the percentage of SNPs that's in that functional category. So if it's 1% of SNPs, but it explains 10% of SNP heritability, then it's 10 times enriched for heritability. How fine grained can those subdivisions be? Because if you're within the same LD block and you have a bunch of different functional categories, every SNP is influencing every other SNP in that LD block, and yet you're partitioning them to different categories. Is there any- I mean, the answer is it can be very fine grained. I mean, you could have like, you can imagine a set of, you know, I don't know, a hundred SNPs that all have LD of 0.8 with each other. But if, you know, in terms of an, you know, if, if you're doing fine mapping at a single locus and you've got a hundred SNPs that each have an LD of 0.8 with each other, it's probably a disaster for successfully fine mapping an individual locus. And that's why fine mapping an individual locus is a statistically incredibly hard problem. And most locus, most I simply cannot be uh, effectively fine mapped. But once you talk about integrating information about coding and regulatory SNPs and whatnot across an entire genome of data, then you, you can kind of start to tease that apart and actually get pretty precise estimates of what the heritability causally explained by coding SNPs or causability, you know, causally explained by regulatory SNPs and so on actually is. Thank you. All right. And so I've been a little bit, you know, fast and loose about overlapping versus non-overlapping, but it actually works totally fine if the functional categories are overlapping, like, you know, maybe you have one functional annotation which has values one for coding SNPs and zero for non-coding SNPs. And then you have a different functional annotation that has 
uh, you know, value one for SNPs that are conserved across mammals and zero for SNPs that are not conserved across mammals. But of course, there's some level of overlap between coding SNPs and SNPs that are conserved across mammals. Those are overlapping functional categories. And it turns out it's totally fine if they're overlapping. We have to, you know, sorry, we have to make the functional interpretation of the slope. You know, if they're non-overlapping, you know, we have some kind of simple, 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 you know, generalization of, you know, n divided by m times SNP heritability. Once the functional categories are overlapping, it starts to get a little bit different uh, difficult to, to think about how we interpret this slope, but we can still interpret the slope if we do it carefully and we can still, you know, define enrichment in much the same way in terms of like, you know, maybe coding SNPs might be 1% of all SNPs, but might explain 10% of heritability and the same for, for a zillion other functional annotations that could be included in the same model. And we could even take it a step further and look at continuous functional annotations, which we did in a follow-up paper from 2017. And here again, I'm going to gloss over the details other than to say that that you know, everything that you do with binary annotations, you can pretty much do all the same math with continuous valued functional annotations if you just you know, introduce a few extra bells and whistles along the way. And I should mostly skip this slide other than to say that you know, we have an extra layer of complexity of introducing some regression weights to account for the fact that um, you, know, you have correlated data. If one SNP in the regression is correlated to another SNP in the regression, then that's redundant information and we should correct for redundant information. And there's a, a different phenomenon, which is, it, it's actually a statistically correlated phenomenon, but it's a fundamentally different phenomenon, you know, involving heteroscedasticity in which we know that a SNP with higher LD scores has a higher mean and also variance on its chi-squared. And we should probably account for that as well so that SNPs with high LD scores don't totally dominate the output of the regression. So those, those are some bells and whistles which we don't have to go over in detail. So in the original 2015 work, these are some of the functional categories that we looked at, um, you know, coding SNPs, uh, SNPs that are conserved across mammals, various flavors of enhancers, uh, histone marks, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is a set of simulations uh, showing that, you know, as, as we might expect, um, the method pr pr um, produces unbiased estimates in an idealized uh, situation in which all of the um, causal categories, in this case, the causal category is DHS, which is um, a functional annotation, a DNA's one hypersensitivity sites, it's a marker of open chromatin. Uh, and as long as the model knows about the causal categories, it should come as no surprise that, that LD score regression, regardless of whether we just tell it about these two categories, DHS and non-DHS, or whether we tell about it the full baseline model with all of these different annotations that you throw in 30 annotations in the model and do a, a, a multilinear regression on 30 you know, annotation categories. Either way, it works pretty well, uh, just as if you used individual level data REML methods uh, to partition the heritability across the two categories. All those approaches produce basically unbiased estimates. But the tricky bit comes when you have causal categories that are not in the model. So, you know, in this case, um, you know, we have, uh, we're gonna keep, you're gonna use the same causal category, um, you know, DHS, but we're gonna not put that causal category in the LD score regression model. Um, if we, you know, if we have like two, two categories, um, you know, uh, where, you know, we're, we're looking at, or, or I guess we're, we're, telling that we're telling the model about DHS and non-DHS, but then we're gonna evaluate the enrichment of these other categories like coding or phantom five enhancer. And you can see that both REML individual level database methods and LD score regression methods sort of, uh, you know, don't work very well when they don't know about uh, these causal categories like flanking regions or coding regions or enhancer regions. And th this isn't really a big surprise you know, if you lie to a model about what the truth is, and then the model then tries to do inference without knowing the full truth, it's probably going to produce a biased result. But the good news is if we try to run LD score regression and we include all these, you know, categories of the baseline model that we use when we run uh, stratified LD score regression, and then we remove the, uh, um, the causal category, but we include all, we retain all the other categories in the baseline model, then the good news is that stratified LD score regression still produces pretty close to unbiased estimates. And this is saying that the baseline model is rich enough. It's got, you know, enough different functional categories in there that it knows about that even if there's, you know, a, a few of them that are missing, of course, we cannot, we cannot, we, we simply should, we should not believe that the baseline model literally captures literally every aspect of, of, you know, real life functional enrichment. It just includes a handful of 30 annotations that we know about, but the evidence seems to be that even if we, you know, remove a category or two, which is causal and which we try to do inference on, 
then the remaining 29 categories that are in the model seem to provide enough richness, enough modeling richness that, um, that the model misspecification is minimal and we're still able to produce at least pretty close to unbiased estimates. Uh, and that's, you know, in comparison to if we either run LD score regression using just two categories like DHS and non-DHS, or equivalently, if we run individual methods that analyze individual data just using DHS and non-DHS, then we run into problems. And the individual level data methods are not currently, have not been adapted or designed to run uh, on like 30 overlapping uh, or in some cases, continuous valued functional annotation category. So it's not really an option right now to say that we're gonna run REML using a large number of overlapping categories or even continuous valued annotations. All right, there, there's a subtlety that I feel like I should skip over where you, know, you can still violate model assumptions if you're not careful. If you, you, know, if you look at like top CCQTL in gene expression data, then that's an example of, of an annotation that, that doesn't satisfy the fundamental model assumption that any SNP, that as a function of its annotations, you know, SNP effect should be IID because it, it turns out that you know, SNPs that are in LD with top CCQTL might be causal EQTL because top CCQTL might be tagging. And so that the, ana the analysis of this annotation of top CCQTL fundamentally violates the, the modeling assumption that is a function of, of, of the, the functional annotations that you're looking at, you know, uh, all SNPs are IID subject condition on their annotation values. And that modeling assumption turns out to be false if you look at an annotation called top CCQTL, which can include a lot of tagging SNPs that just happen to be the top CCQTL, the locus. And you can get into un, un, uh, biased estimates, both for SLDC as well as other methods when you do inference uh, under those circumstances. All right, so I don't have a lot of time left. This is a natural time to switch gears from the methods piece to the real data piece, which to me is really the best way to kind of teach methods science is to see what's going on when you look at real data. So now we're gonna look at some of the applications of this method to uh, some chromatin data and also some gene expression data. And we maybe we might even get to LD dependent architectures. So these are some, these are the 17 traits that we analyzed in the initial work. These are all publicly available summary statistics and fairly large sample size. These days, 100,000 would count as fairly large, fairly large and not extremely large. Extremely large would be like 500,000 or a million, but still fairly large sample size. And uh, you know, one of the initial findings is that um, coding SNPs actually are enriched for uh, SNP heritability of diseases and complex traits, depending on which particular traits you're looking at. Um, uh, you know, we see the largest enrichments for autoimmune diseases and height, and maybe slightly lower enrichments for schizophrenia and BMI. And likewise, different flavors of, of enhancer and enhancer related annotations, various regulatory annotations, uh, are likewise enriched, maybe not as enriched as coding SNPs, but still have substantial uh, excess enrichment for diseases and complex traits. And it, interestingly, SNPs that are, this is SNPs that are conserved across 29 mammals were actually uh, one of the most enriched functional categories, uh, you know, even more enriched uh, for heritability than coding SNPs. And that's saying that, that SNPs that, you know, in the sort of, uh, uh, you know, mammalian phylogeny, you, you know, where they, you have a SNP in humans in a part of the genome that has just not tolerated any mutations in the course of mammalian phylogeny, then that means that that SNP is probably doing something important. And if it's doing something important, that it might have a pretty substantial impact on disease. And that's what this analysis is telling us. And then we looked at phantom five enhancers, which are a particular uh, very specialized uh, enhancer assay. And in the case of phantom five enhancers, we saw a very large and statistically significant enrichment for autoimmune diseases and nothing appreciable for the other traits. Okay, so should we also <laughs> interpret these results as BMI has more to do with survival than height or schizophrenia or immune or not? You wouldn't read into that. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's, I think, well, we have to, I mean, we have to pay attention to the standard errors here. Yeah. Um, I think it's true. Well, so first of all, we, if we have a SNP that influences, uh, you know, let's take schizophrenia as example. Schizophrenia is a good example. Um, if we have a SNP that increases your risk of schizophrenia, there's a point of view that says, well, if a SNP is going to increase your risk of schizophrenia, schizophrenics, individuals with schizophrenia on average have fewer children. That's probably been true for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Then, you know, mutations which, you know, increase your risk of schizophrenia probably cause you to have fewer children. But what, what the community actually believes is that there's something else that's going on, something called plyotropic selection, where if you have a SNP that influences schizophrenia, it probably impacts the brain in all sorts of ways. And, you know, 
It might even be a SNP that reduces your risk of schizophrenia, but it's still gonna impact the brain in a profound way. And nearly all mutations, you know, do have a bad, have a, have a you know, bad impact on fitness. Now, of course, we know that there's a few mutations that have done great things that have caused us to be humans and not chimps over the past five million years, but nearly all the time, mutations do bad things. Even if it's a mutation that's gonna reduce your risk of schizophrenia, it's probably doing a bad thing. And so there, there's some sort of unsigned coupling between SNPs that impact schizophrenia and you know, SNPs that impact uh, reproductive fitness. So there is some sort of coupling there. And you know, maybe we might read into uh, the sort of strength of that coupling being lower, higher for some traits and lower for other traits. And you know, maybe it might be higher for brain-related traits because brain-related traits, SNPs that impact brain-related traits you know, might be under strong negative selection and maybe less so for autoimmune diseases, perhaps. Yeah, and uh, I also want to point out to the class, of course, that directionality doesn't matter. So it's not BMI per se for either super thin or super heavy. It's really that stuff that has to do with metabolism, period, right? Yeah, and really, you know, any SNP that impacts anything is probably you know, any SNP that impacts just about any disease or complex trait is probably in, in, impacting something else as well, which would re probably reduces fitness or the derived allele is probably reducing fitness. Great, carry on, thank you. And why are these categories functionally enriched? It turns out in this work paper on polygenicity, and I'm not gonna get into the details of the method, the, the ultimate conclusion was that the reason why these functional categories are in, enriched for heritability is not, it's actually not due to larger causal effect sizes. It's not like you have the same number of causal SNPs, but they have larger effect sizes. That's not true at all, because it turns out that the common SNPs have some kind of soft upper bound on what the effect sizes can be due to the constraint of negative selection, where if, if a SNP does a lot of things, you know, negative selection is not gonna allow that SNP to increase to, be, to being common in the, in, in the population. And so it's not so much about you have the same number of causal SNPs with larger effect sizes. Instead, it's you have more causal SNPs that each have this kind of like medium or small to medium effect size, causal effect size due to the soft bound imposed by negative selection condi condi conditional on becoming a, a common SNP. So it's really more about how many of the SNPs in the, uh, in the functional category do something. And it's not about like, the SNPs that do something have huge effects. Could you explain what low frequency means? Oh, uh, so low frequency here uh, is, um, uh, 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 so lo low frequency is, so mostly we're talking about common SNPs. Um, low frequency SNPs are SNPs between one and 5% minor allele frequency. Right. And so uh, both in terms of heritability enrichment and in terms of polygen polygenicity enrichment, uh, uh, this means that low frequency SNPs are less polygenic. They, there tends to be less heritability per SNP and, um, and, and, and they also tend to have sparser effects. Isn't this a little counterintuitive? Isn't what a little counterintuitive? That, that they're at that end. You would expect that the low frequency are perhaps low frequency because they're being selected not to be high frequency. Okay, so I, I, should, be, I should be a little bit more careful in how I explain this. Um, the x-axis is heritability enrichment. For, for, for any given SNP, the amount of heritability explained by that SNP is proportional to its per allele effect size squared times P times one minus P, where P is the allele frequency. So on the one hand, we know that um, uh, we know that, with, that rarer SNPs, such as low frequency SNPs, have larger per allele effect sizes. Each allele has a larger effect. But we also know that after you multiply by P times one minus P, they actually have smaller per SNP heritability. Yeah. So the normalized one might actually be at the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, if you were to look at per allele effect size, yeah. then, then ra rarer SNPs would on average have larger per allele effect sizes or squared per allele effect sizes. Thank you. All right. And so, so now we're gonna get into the part, uh, uh, we're finally at long last gonna get into the part that corresponds to the title of the talk having to do with uh, inferring disease critical cell types. And so this is in the original 2015 paper uh, looking at um, cell type specific regulatory annotations, uh, looking at the ones that were most enriched for a particular disease. And you know, this, this is obviously just a few of the most notable examples, but for schizophrenia, it's, it's brain regulatory annotations that are most enriched. For height, it's connective bone regulatory annotations that are most enriched. And for motrite arthritis, it's, um, uh, uh, it's immune uh, cell types that are most enriched. And this is of course, very consistent with, with known biological knowledge. And this is a proof of concept, at least on this slide, that you can use um, cell type tissue or cell type specific regulatory annotations coupled with uh, a disease heritability enrichment analysis using stratified least score regression to infer disease critical tissues and cell types for diseases and complex traits.
This is a large, larger set of uh, traits on this slide. And some of these, including smoking and educational attainment, where it's not a huge surprise that the brain would be important. But these are results that you know, had not previously been attained with genetic data due to a very limited number of genome-wide significant SNPs for these traits at the time that the Fanukin 2015 study was conducted. I think it was one and three genome-wide significant loci respectively for these traits. And this is a demonstration, especially for these highly polygenic traits um, that a, a genome-wide polygenic approach can in some instances yield greater biological insights than traditional approaches that focus their efforts on genome-wide significant SNPs, which may be very low in number for these highly polygenic traits. All right, so this is a follow-up paper of Fanukin 2018, where we're using specifically expressed genes. So this is kind of a totally different approach. Now we're getting into gene expression data and we're using specifically expressed genes. And so this is saying that genes that are specifically expressed in brain relative to other tissues uh, are enriched for schizophrenia. Genes that are specifically expressed in connective tissues compared to other tissues have uh, are enriched heritability for height. And genes that are specifically expressed in blood cell types or immune cell types have enriched heritability for rheumatoid arthritis. So this is very much a complementary approach using a different type of data than the sort of uh, cell type specific uh, histone marks or chromatin marks that we were talking about a moment ago. And uh, you know, these results were in general broadly concordant with the results on chromatin data, but there are instances uh, of data sets where you actually get better resolution in the gene expression data that's available as compared to the chromatin data that's available. So it's a complementary approach. Uh, I mentioned continuous functional annotation, so I am going to have to head out in a couple minutes, but there's a piece here on continuous functional annotation that has to do with LD-dependent architectures, where an LD-dependent architecture refers to the dependence of causal effect sizes on the level of LD of a SNP after conditioning on minor allele frequency. And we were very surprised to see that SNPs with lower levels of LD, even after you've adjusted for math, have larger causal effect sizes. And this is true for all 56 traits that we studied from age at menarche to unibrow, where there's a fundamental effect where SNPs with lower LD have larger causal effect sizes. The story here is rich and complicated. It turns out to have something to do with negative selection. And um, there's reasons why negative selection kind of plays into these LD related annotations and leads to this phenomenon that um, SNPs with lower levels of LD at a given minor allele frequency actually have larger causal effect sizes. So it looks like I've run out of time. I'm sure Manolis can share these slides with you and we, you can see maybe on your own time the piece of this that has to do with analyzing single cell RNA-seq data to learn at sort of more exquisite resolution some things about uh, disease criti critical cell types. Other than that, I'm gonna have to go. I might have time for maybe another one or two very quick questions. I, I want to really thank uh, Alkis for a beautiful, beautiful presentation. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't think we should hold you any longer since you have actually a class starting at two o'clock. So thank you so much. Okay, Alex. thanks for the invitation. Thank you, bye-bye. Um, all right, Manny, I, think, I see that you're here as well. So um, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, the, uh, Professor Manuel Rivas from Stanford University. A longtime friend and, uh, uh, you know, in many ways, collaborator, especially through his most recent student, Joske. So, um, Manny, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. So he'll be telling us today about how do we combine electronic health records, genome-wide association studies, and genomics, basically taking what Alki is focused on, which is one trade at a time, and now asking, how does that apply when we look at the en entire electronic health record of a very large cohort of individuals? Uh, Manny, take it away. Thank you, Manolis. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, first, I'll describe some of the work that we're doing in terms of combining data across multiple phenotypes. So just to give a brief overview, one of the data sets that, uh, let's see, that we have been thoroughly studying is the UK Biobank data set. It's a population-based cohort of approximately 500,000 individuals with a mixture of electronic health records, web-based questionnaire data, uh, genotyping, baseline biochemistry and imaging data as well. So it's a rich resource with thousands of phenotypes uh, and very rich data set on um, the genetic level as well. So the typical approach that we take for analyzing genetic data, uh, so this study was led by Yosuke Tanigawa. Uh, it's in Nature Communications, Components of Genetic Associations Across 2000 Phenotypes in UK Biobank. So typically in a genetic study, what we do is to run linear regressions a million times over uh, say a mi million genetic variants for a single phenotype. 
as some of the uh, analysis that Arcus Price described. So typically what you find is uh, polygenic characteristics where multiple genetic variants across the genome are associated to a given trait. Given that we had access to UK Biobank across thousands of phenotypes, we can also ask the question for a given variant that we find to be associated with a phenotype, are there associations as well to other phenotypes um, among the thousands of phenotypes we have access to? And this is just one example of a genetic variant where we've analyzed uh, the association for uh, multiple phenotypes. So here, this genetic variant has association to many fat measures. Um, uh, here on the x-axis is just the minus log 10 p-values of the linear regression model applied to those phenotypes. And on the right hand, we have uh, a beta or effect size plot where we see the effect size across these multiple measurements that we have access to. It also makes you question if they misinterpreted the question about being fed up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Uh, you know, so sometimes you get some spurious associations as well, but other times it may be ascertainment issues. So one of the uh, nice things about uh, the characteristics of genetic association studies is that we have access to extreme polygenic uh, traits and we have pervasive pleiotropy, which sometimes limits the interpretability of genetic associations for. So here is just a diagram where we connect the genetic variants of the genome across thousands of traits. And you see many connections mappings between the genetic variants and the traits. So one of the questions we asked is whether some of those connections can be described by a lower latent component that maybe can be best characterized by maybe hundreds of components. So some form of um, uh, lower rank dimensional representation of the genetic association studies. Uh, and as, as Alka showed, uh, for many of the traits that he's analyzed, he sees some shared characteristics. Uh, and that is definitely true of the UK Biobank data as well. So this approach we refer to as decomposition of genetic associations, where the idea is to disentangle many to many mappings into uh, fewer uh, components. So we refer to this approach as Degas after the painter uh, Edgar Degas. And the idea is that for any given phenotype, uh, as this pictorial diagram seems to show, uh, for any given phenotype, you may be the, uh, the genetic components may be shared across many other traits. So here's just an example of, of one phenotype with genetic components shared with uh, the green component, the blue component, and the pink component, for example. So one of the things that we had access to was access to the genetic mapping of thousands of traits. So we can represent that data as a matrix W, uh, where on the uh, X axis, we have the variants, and on the Y axis, we have the phenotypes. I think this data set was about 500,000 variants or 2,000 phenotypes. Uh, the matrix itself is composed of summary level data, so summary statistics, and that, that will be a theme that you'll hear more and more in this talk. Uh, and summary statistic is just of the flavor of a you know, linear regression effect size estimate, along with a p-value or z-scores that corresponds to that p-value. Uh, so one of the approaches that we took was to just apply a truncated singular value decomposition uh, approach to that matrix and to represent that matrix in a lower rank component of about 100 components, 100 PCs. So each component is a product of orthogonal elements in these three matrices, U, S, and B of T. So you can see how a phenotype loads to each component or how a matrix also, uh, sorry, how a variant also loads to that component. So when we applied it to the data, uh, the first two components, given that the UK Biobank is extremely rich in anthropometric measurements, uh, you can see that the first two components of the data in terms of genetic associations is best characterized by the anthropometric phenotypes. So on the x-axis, we represent PC1, and the y-axis is PC2. And then you can see how each of the phenotypes loads onto these two components. Uh, for example, the projection of height is sits squarely on uh, in the middle between PC1 and PC2. Uh, weight is sits on PC1. Uh, and other measurements like hand grip strength, for example, are, are driven by a mixture of the two. Uh, similarly, we could do this for the genetic variants. So to see how they load onto the uh, two components, 
So here, for example, if we're looking at uh, FTO, this is a genetic variant here, uh, that, that's in tronic variant on FTO, you could see that it projects onto this component uh, four, which maps onto, uh, sorry, this component PC1, PC2, which labeled four, which maps onto the weight uh, component. And, and similarly, other variants like MC4R um, and BDNF lie more on the, the weight component, whereas other genetic variants like SCN4A map a bit more on the height component of the composition. Well, I have to say that um, in, a, in a way, I feel that there's so much more richness because every one of these arrows should be plotting in a much higher dimensional space than two. That's right, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So to I uh, appreciate as you go down um, into just this uh, characterizing a specific phenotype. So here, for example, if we're looking at body mass index, you can see the contribution of a mixture of components. Uh, so, so these are just the phenotypes that contribute to it. Uh, but here it's just describing PC2 and PC1. But these two components just make up about 60%, uh, 65% of the variance, whereas a larger uh, set of other components contribute to the remaining 35% uh, of the variance. So uh, here, just to characterize, you know, PC2 corresponds more to the fat component of body mass index. Uh, if we look at the phenotypes that load onto that projection, uh, and PC1 corresponds more to the fat-free mass component. So the composition and contribution components for given trait can be quantified with some scores. And here is a way that you can give meaning to each of the components. So body mass index, not surprisingly, is made up of a fat component and a fat-free mass component. Now, this has um, consequences for how we think about genetic risk as well. So if you were to think about the genetic risk of BMI, uh, you know, the genetic risk of BMI would uh, contrib be contributed of a fat component and a fat-free component among the other components as well. So one way that we use this in order to uh, study some specific genetic variants was looking at these protein truncating variants uh, that are predicted to have strong functional consequences on gene function. Uh, one of the reasons that we're quite interested in these protein truncating variants is that they give pretty much direct um, inference as to what gene is, the, is involved, what variant is involved. In addition to that, we also have some PTVs that we identify to have strong effect sizes. Uh, here, uh, looking at the uh, decomposition of genetic associations for PTVs or these protein truncating variants across the thousands of traits. Again, uh, if we focus on PC1 and here uh, for the, the PTVs, it's PC3 that makes up the second uh, largest contribution to body mass index. Uh, we see a genetic variant here labeled S2 uh, that projects onto the component that corresponds to like fat free mass and high cholesterol level. And that corresponds to this genetic variant or PTV in this gene called PD3B. So it has more of a high cholesterol, fat-free mass contribution to uh, BMI. Whereas if we focus on one, uh, which corresponds to this axis here, this one uh, corresponds to phenotype five and six, uh, and five corresponds to hip circumference and weight. So more of the fat component of body mass index. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're quite interested in this is because we want to uh, identify genetic variants that may contribute to uh, adipogenesis or li uh, lipolysis effects rather than just having uh, a fat-free uh, effect on body mass index. Uh, and so one of the things that we did was to take some of these variants for functional follow-up and GPR-151 does seem to have uh, functional consequences on adipogenesis, which is quite nice. And here, if you were just to represent uh, the association of that genetic variant across uh, the set of phenotypes that we had access to, you can see that a large fraction of these um, are fat mass uh, measurements with some fat-free mass measurements as well associated with the genetic variant. So one of the things that we've done as well is to uh, make available the genetic associations for 2000 phenotypes on this website called Global Biobank Engine. And the idea is that it becomes a search portal for anybody to either search their favorite gene, their favorite variant or phenotype and browse a set of associations that are available by combining the sets of rich phenotypes that's available in UK Biobank. Uh, 
with the hundreds of thousands of genetic parents that are also available. It's a resource that's available online at biobankengine.stanford.edu and available to anybody in the world. And currently it supports a mixture of data, including exome sequencing data, array genotyping from UK Biobank, Million Veterans Program, Biobank Japan, and some meta-analysis as well, where the idea is to combine uh, the summary statistics across uh, the three biobanks in order to improve power for detecting genetic associations. Uh, Million Veterans Program is one of those projects based in the United States that has very rich combination of electronic health records with genetic data. So uh, some of the ideas that come to bear here are also being applied in, in that setting as well and, and in Biobank Japan. In fact, there's this one paper where we apply this uh, singular value decomposition approach across summary statistics to the combination of UK Biobank and Biobank Japan summary statistics. So one area that I did want to share with you um, is also identifying these experiments of nature. So these mutations that are predicted to have strong effect on gene function that sometimes have the effect of lowering risk for disease. Um, and one of the reasons why we're quite excited about that space is because then it uh, does lead to some therapeutic hypotheses that we may want to follow up by uh, mimicking the effects of those mutations. And it can guide the selection of targets for, for drug discovery as well. And I'll just give you a few examples of those where we've succeeded in identifying some strong effect mutations. Um, so just to give you a, a snapshot of the data sets that we're looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, data sets that are quite massive in scale from millions of samples to tens of thousands of measurements. So how do you then identify and hone in uh, and, and tons of millions of gender variants? So how do you hone in into uh, specific genetic hypotheses that may you want to follow up later. Uh, one way to do that is by going from these big data sets to small data, set, uh, data sets where you have summary statistics and uh, diving deep into genetic variants that are predicted to have strong functional effects and a strong effect size as well. Uh, in the UK Biobank, we've identified loss of function truncating variants that are predicted to uh, break the protein coding sequence of genes. And in the study that we uh, ran in 2018, we tried to identify uh, individuals that carry these human knockout mutations, uh, individuals that were likely to have a broken copy of a gene. And in fact, instead of conferring risk to disease, these individuals seem to con have conferred protection against disease. One example of that is a protein truncating variant that protects against asthma. Uh, by looking at multiple measurements, including blood biomarkers, we were able to identify that these mutations ended up lowering, having strong lowering effects on eosinophil counts, and also having about a twofold to threefold decreased risk uh, against asthma in this gene called IL-33. Similarly, in a gene called IFIH1, we identified strong effect mutations that uh, lowered the risk for type 1 diabetes, lowered the risk for hypothyroidism, psoriasis, but also seems to increase risk for other diseases like ulcerative colitis. Nonetheless, uh, paving the way to a pretty strong therapeutic hypothesis because the effect size were about twofold uh, conferred protection against type 1 diabetes uh, and about 1.5 fold effects for psoriasis and hypothyroidism. So uh, a theme from this is basically the idea that we learn from these experiments of nature across populations. And one of the areas that we've put a lot of effort into is uh, making these resources available so that we can improve inference by combining summary statistics across multiple biobanks. So uh, first I gave you a flavor as to what you do if you have access to data from a single biobank with thousands of phenotypes. Now, what do you do in the setting of having access to multiple biobanks? Uh, and one powerful way to improve your inference of the connection between genetic variants and phenotypes is to combine at the level of data, of the summary level data. And that's what we've done with other biobanks like FinGen and Biobank Japan and Million Veterans Program. And, and it just give you a highlight as to how you can identify specific genetic variants with strong 
effects on gene function, but also have strong effects on uh, phenotypes. One of the things that we've done is to combine these phenotypes in order to visualize the relationship between the genetics of human traits and diseases. So we've uh, estimated genetic parameters like correlation of genetic effects and heritability or polygenicity of disease, which you've heard a bit more about from August Price talk, uh, where the idea is to characterize the extent to which uh, the contribution of genetic variants uh, contributes to the phenotypic variants for, for any given trait and how that relates in terms of uh, the covariance of, of specific uh, pairs of traits as well. So lastly, one of the things that I did want to focus in on is the uh, concept of polygenic risk models. So he, uh, the first part basically emphasizes how to use genotype data or genetic data with phenotype data to improve inference. So identifying genetic variants that you may want to either functionally follow up or maybe provide a therapeutic hypothesis um, or maybe describe you know, this set of genetic variants are linked to these hundreds of phenotypes together in some lower rank representation component. But one of the other activities that we're quite excited about is risk prediction. So how can you use genetic data to improve your ability to, to uh, predict disease risk? So one uh, theme from uh, the application of statistics to human genetic data is that typically the way we think about uh, the relationship between a genetic variant and a phenotype is in terms of a univariate model. So you apply a linear regression or logistic regression, one variant, one phenotype at a time, and you apply that a million times over uh, and over again. And then if you had access to thousands of phenotypes, you would apply a million regressions a thousand times independently of each other. Now, this uh, does provide the benefit of giving direct interpretation it does provide some convenient computation uh, and it's fine with small sample sizes. However, for prediction, it has pretty weak properties because uh, many genetic variants as we've learned uh, come correlated with each other. So it's quite hard to distinguish which is the one that should be involved in your model because it, it, if, you know, if the task is for prediction, uh, you'd be double continent over and over again because there are just many variants that are co come correlated with each other. That, that problem is referred to as linkage disequilibrium, uh, which basically refers to correlation among the genetic variants. So one other approach is to take this multivariate model. The idea is basically that uh, you fit one very large regression model where Y is your response, and then X, uh, the, the predictor, becomes a very large model of millions of variables. The challenge is that it's less interpretable uh, it does introduce some high computational cost. Uh, you do need more data. However, since you've set it up as a predictive problem, it does lead to better predictive performance. So in terms of terminology, uh, in the UK Biobank, we refer to this, these problems as large scale problems because there are hundreds of thousands of samples. So N is very large. Uh, we refer to the problems as high dimensional because there are hundreds of thousands of variables as well. Uh, given that we have hundreds of thousands of genetic variants to fit into one model. The package that we've developed in order to fit a multivariate regression model uh, to basically fit a response to all million genetic variants at a time is referred to as SNPNet package. And the idea is that here we implement uh, uh, LASSO, the LASSO algorithm, which is a penalized regression framework that was developed by Rob Tipsharani and Trevor Hasty. Uh, so these are the co-authors of the paper led by Young Yang Kiang, who, is, uh, who just graduated from Stanford, uh, who led this work. Uh, here on the x-axis is just a representation as to how this model fit works. Uh, on the x-axis, since this is penalized regression, you have some lambda index that tells you how penalized uh, the model should be. So as you go from zero to 80, uh, the less penalization occurs. And as you see on x-axis two, uh, the more variables that are included in your model. On the y-axis, you have R squared, which is the variance explained for the height that we're trying to predict. Uh, here, the trait that we're representing is standing height. Uh, on the red, sorry, red and black curve will represent lasso. Uh, 
the black curve corresponds to the fit of the model on the training data, uh, and red corresponds to the fit of the model on the validation data. And as we'd expect, uh, the model is supposed to saturate at a certain moment in time with the validation data. And that is when we decide to tell the model to stop, uh, to stop adding variables. So here for standing height, we've uh, included 47,000 variables into the model that gives a prediction or performance of about R squared of about 0 0.70 for standing height. The green and the blue curve represent another model, which is referred to as relaxed lasso. The idea is that you use uh, lasso for variable selection, but that you don't penalize the regression coefficients. So one of the observations here, at least, is that penalizing the regression coefficients uh, does allow you to get better improvement in predictive performance relative to an unpenalized form. So, uh, so, so these methods are implemented uh, for anybody who's interested. We also have access uh, implemented elastic net regression, which has an L1 and L2 penalty. Uh, the models are a bit denser, uh, but it, it has comparable predictive performance to LASSO as well. So we've applied these polygenic risk score models for 35 biomarkers. This work was led by Yosuke Tanigawa and NASA Sina Armstrong. Um, the idea was that we end up predicting predictive models for these biomarkers, that are cardiovascular biomarkers, renal biomarkers, liver biomarkers. Uh, first, we created a 70% training data set, 10% validation to help us choose when to stop fitting the model, and then a 20% test split that allowed us to then say, this is the performance of the models when you've uh, trained it across the UK biobank. And similarly, we've applied it to additional test set populations, including non-British Europeans, South Asian, East Asian, and African populations. And one of the lessons that we've taken from this is that um, there is some limitation in uh, transferring, reporting over these polygenic risk scores over to non-European populations. So here's just an example of the variance explained in the white British component of the UK biobank is about 50% for this biomarker called lipoprotein A. For LDL, it's about 22% for uh, the white British uh, European subset of, of UK biobank. In the non-British European, the performance is quite comparable as well. It's so about 40% and about 20% for LDL. But now as you move to South Asian, East Asian and African population, you see the performance of these models drop dramatically. And there are many reasons for it. Amongst them uh, are the differences in correlation structure across uh, the different populations. So transferring over uh, these predictive models from one population that uses proxies of causal variants for prediction uh, may not work as well in other populations because those, those proxies end up breaking down in terms of the relationship of correlation structure amongst the genetic variants. And in addition to that, you also have different sets of genetic variants that may explain the, the, the heritability of the, of the disease or the phenotype here being the biomarker. And just to give you an overall high level summary as to how this looks, uh, the notable exception is total bilirubin and direct bilirubin where an African population is, still has quite comparable performance to the white British and European subset in UK Biobank. Uh, but you can see that there is a dramatic drop in performance, about 80% drop in performance as we move to the African population. So this calls for the need for uh, these population-based cohorts that combine EHRs, genetic data in non-European populations. And I think that's one of the, the, the more exciting areas of research in human genetics over the next years is really starting to bring some of that data together. So Manuel. Uh... Yes. It, 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 I mean, this is fascinating, and I couldn't agree more about the importance of, of tapping into sort of the, the, the broader human genetic variation rather than this ta tiny little subset that is captured by the European samples that most of GWAS has focused on. I'm curious about the sources of that variation, because I think this, this can sort of have big effects in guiding a lot of the study designs. The, the one, one reason for the discrepancy could simply be that the genetic variants that are responsible for a lot of the European variation are simply not even found in Africa. These are variants right. that have arisen after the out of Africa event, or at least, you know, sort of greatly increased in frequency in the Africa event, in the out of Africa event by sort of 
capturing capturing it a subset of the of the variation to and bring it to higher frequency. That's that's one option. The variance is not even there. Another option is that the variant is there but doesn't have the same effect in the context of different environments. And when I'm talking about environments, I also mean the cellular environment of all of the other genetic variants that the variant is acting within. So, and for that, at mixed populations, like you know, African-Americans, for example, can give you a sense of how much is the rest of the genome contributing to the differential effect of that one variant. I'm curious if you've looked into these or if you, you have some insights to share through your group or other groups as to whether it's absence of variants or actually different effects of these variants. I mean, in addition, yeah. of course, to the LD component that you mentioned. Absolutely. I think the absence of variance is a major contributor in the context of inflammatory bowel disease. When you move from European to East Asian population, for example, you do see the absence of some of the variants in the East Asian populations that are major contributors in, in European populations. Uh, in terms of effect size distribution uh, or homogeneity of effect sizes, uh, we do see when the variant is present across multiple populations, the effect sizes are quite homogeneous. Uh, there are there are examples of heterogeneity though, um, and and I agree with you that you know one way to get at that problem is to look at admixed populations, um, but but the the absence of the variance is a huge contributor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that's one example where you know looking at for example lipoprotein A, lipoprotein A is a very simple example. The reason is that lipoprotein A has maybe. Uh, tens of genetic variants that contribute to the variants. They are all in lipoprotein A region, right? They're a mixture of non-coding variants, coding variants, and even structural variants. The reasons why it performs so poorly in uh, the African population is that the proxies for those genetic variants that are captured in the European populations don't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, great. And with that, I'd like to end by just thanking um, everybody in the lab that has contributed to this and largely Yusuke Tanigawa, who um, I'm very happy will be joining Manolitis Lab. Awesome. Manuel, thank you so much for a beautiful lecture. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions, but um, I, uh, I, I mostly want to thank uh, both uh, Manuel and Alekis for uh, two awesome, awesome presentations. So Manuel, I mean, we are so fortunate to be able to have people of your caliber join us on uh you know just for even 30 minutes i mean you know the the um, the proximity that we've had despite the distancing of the proximal people is uh you know uh, one of the perks i have to say of, of this horrible situation that we're in one of the questions that i always ask uh our, our guests is will, will you be able and willing to sort of supervise students who are interested in doing research projects in these topics especially with uh UK biobank, polygenic scores, and uh, pleiotropic effects. Absolutely. Would love to. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Manuel. All right. Thank you. All I right. think we have a... Oh, just thank you <laughs> in the chat. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And then... Right, see you okay. Bye-bye. Well, thank you. The TAs can come around.